presentation here on case studies in adrenal hormone testing and treatment. I think you'll find this information informative, particularly if you're a healthcare practitioner that works with individuals with fatigue and other suspected adrenal hormone issues, but also individuals themselves who may be suffering with fatigue and different types of chronic health problems. Just get a better understanding of how some of these issues may apply to your specific situation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to give a little background on some webinars, or excuse me, some seminars that I have been involved in now uh, through Great Plains Lab. If you are a healthcare practitioner and you are interested in learning more about organic acids testing and specifically how to incorporate organic acids testing into your practice, then there are one-day seminars that are being held throughout the United States and Canada. And we've had a number now in Seattle, Houston, as well as San Francisco, and upcoming seminars in San Diego and throughout the country. And I realize this is going to be recorded and hosted on Great Plains' website. So I'm not going to give specific dates, but if you want to find out more about a webinar, excuse me, a seminar in your particular area, just go to greatplainslaboratory.com, enter, and then go under the resource section, and you can look specifically for an upcoming organic acids testing one-day intensive in your particular area. So what we're going to be discussing is steps to evaluating salivary adrenal tests and then questions that I feel are really important that all individuals should be asked uh, if you're a practitioner should be asked with respect to their adrenal tests. I've got a couple different scenarios and then I'm going to give you a case that I'm going to ask some specific questions so you can think about that while I'm going over that and then some key factors that I feel are important for all adrenal programs. To get started here, let's just get orient ourselves with respect to hormone physiology and the way these things tend to flow uh, throughout the body. And primarily what we're talking about when we're talking about adrenal hormones is the production of cortisol, as you see down here at the left-hand side of the screen. But all of this information flows into this pathway through the production of cholesterol, which is then converted into pregnenolone. Now, pregnenolone can become DHEA, testosterone, as well as estrogen. Pregnenolone also becomes progesterone and, and eventually on to cortisol. This red arrow is that preferential pathway under stress. When the body is stressed, it's going to preferentially pull these hormone reserves to try to maintain normal levels of cholesterol, excuse me, cortisol to keep everything in balance. Unfortunately, because of that, we can run deficits in other hormones. We can start to run deficits in testosterone and estrogen, DHEA, and even progesterone with advanced adrenal fatigue. So it's important to keep that in mind. This chart is really important because this is a tire breakdown of what we call the chronic stress response. Here on the left-hand side, we have this box that are the potential sources of stress anger, worry, depression, you know, mental, emotional states, physical issues, head trauma, inflammation, heavy metals, I mean, the, it goes on and on and on. All of this essentially causes a change within the body. And that change is then perceived by the hypothalamus here in the brain, and it sends out a chemical signal called ACTH that stimulates the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. Cortisol is then produced at an appropriate level, and there should be a feedback mechanism that tells the hypothalamus, we have enough cortisol, we can turn this signal off. And the problem is, is when this particular situation goes on chronically, and we get an overproduction of ACTH, an overproduction of cortisol, and we start to run a deficit here with respect to cortisol and DHEA. That can create blood sugar problems that can lead to a host of issues from heart disease and diabetes, to bone loss through osteoporosis, to hypertension through salt and water retention issues, and then eventually on to immune system problems, which have their own set of problems as well. So almost every chronic health condition we can imagine can be linked to some kind of breakdown in the cortisol DHEA ratio and link back to chronic stress. 
the balance of cortisol and DHEA has its hands in everything with regards to our body. Again, glucose metabolism, inflammation control, the ability to detoxify our body, thyroid function, mental function. There isn't anything in our body that isn't somehow influenced by the adrenal function of cortisol and DHEA. And this particular slide is important just to orient you to understand that many of the symptoms you have with low thyroid can often be caused by stress through the adrenals. We have the HPA axis and the HPT axis. You'll notice here a couple chemicals. CRH, or cortical releasing hormone, is released by the hypothalamus in response to stress. When CRH is released in high amounts, it can have a direct inhibitory effect on thyroid stimulating hormones, causing the thyroid to become deficient. Excess ACTH production from the pituitary will often, you know, in an attempt, try to slow down the hypothalamus response. But at the same time, it's causing an excess production of cortisol. And cortisol itself will actually negatively impact the thyroid too. It blocks the conversion of T4 to T3. So through chronic stress, through the hypothalamus and pituitary axis, we can cause low thyroid. All right, so what are some steps to take when evaluating salivary adrenal and sex hormone testing? You always need to correlate the test with the clinical history of the individual. That's incredibly important. What I typically do is I scan the individual cortisol levels. Ideally, I want to see the value somewhere in that optimal range, kind of what we consider to be that upper one-third of normal range. Also, we scan, I scan the total representation of all four cortisols, looking at the total picture, highs in certain areas, lows in the other. I also want to know, is DHEA low, high? And then we can get a better understanding of what's called pregnenolone steel, that preferential pathway under stress. And this is often where that pregnenolone is being pulled through progesterone to support cortisol production. And long-standing problems often will show low normal or low cortisols and sometimes low normal or low DHEA. That's typical of pregnenolone steel. A few other things to consider here. Each individual cortisol value is reflected by what was going on prior to its production. So the morning cortisol was an indication of what was going on in the middle of the night. The noon cortisol, what was happening early in the morning. Evening cortisol, what was going on around lunchtime or early afternoon. And nighttime cortisol, what was happening in the early evening. A number of other things factor in and that, that we know influence cortisol values. Poor sleep, stimulant uh, use, particularly at nighttime, like caffeine, pain, infections can certainly do it mental, emotional stress, physical stress, and even, you know, I think probably on top of all of this for many people is poor blood sugar control. A couple other things you want to look for, and that is, is evaluate each individual sex hormone just like you did cortisol. So are the values high? Are they low for things like progesterone, estrogen, testosterone? If the values are high, then you want to see particularly if that individual is on some kind of supplement or medication. Let's say a transdermal cream, for example, is almost classic for causing progesterone levels in the saliva to be high. Also, it's important that you need to ask, and don't forget to ask spouses, uh, if, their use of, if they're using transdermal applications. So a patient might say, well, I'm not using it but it could be their husband, their wife is using some kind of cream that is you know, rubbing onto their skin. And as I mentioned before, in saliva testing, transdermal hormones, particularly progesterone, can appear high um, where blood testing you know, may need to correlate if there's symptoms, but blood testing sometimes is not all that conclusive either. A couple of things prior to testing, you may want to alter hormone dosing. The general rule for transdermal creams is about 30, 60 days to have it completely cleared from the system. To monitor therapy, at least you want to get off for about three days to allow, allow for things to level out. Now, granted, you may not have an individual who actually can get off of a transdermal for 30 to 60 days, 
So, you know, adjust accordingly based on how they feel. Most oral capsules, we generally go off three to five days. The sublingual drops, about 36 hours will do. Sublingual tablets, seven to 10 days is probably a better estimate. You want to try and avoid stimulants like caffeine on the testing day. And then what I tell individuals to do when they're doing their saliva sample is if something stressful happens to them on that particular day that is above and beyond what would normally be a stressful event for their, that particular day, I have them start the samples and do it on the next day. So they can rinse out the vials and just restart the saliva collection on another day. Okay, a couple other things to consider here. What about sleep? If you're having an individual or think about this for yourself, what you want to find out and see how that can correlate with the information on the adrenal test. So sleep, what time does this individual go to bed? How long does it take him to fall asleep? Stay asleep. What's the nighttime routine? What we call the, the sleep hygiene. What's, uh, do they take a bath? What's the temperature of the bedroom? Are they on the computer till late at night? Do they eat an evening meal? Are they having alcohol use at night? All of those things can interfere with sleep. And particularly things like how long do they sleep or how long is it taking them to fall asleep can be indicative of the fact that if there's, you know, taking more than 30 to 40 minutes to fall asleep, then you may want to do some intervention, you know, melatonin, et cetera. If they're not sleeping all the way through the night, then you need to figure out why. Maybe they're too hot. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they're in low blood sugar. Those things need to be correlated clinically. A couple other things. Energy level throughout the day. So what is, is their energy better in the morning? When are things the best? When are they the worst? Do they get a second wind at night? Now, that's very typical of adrenal exhaustion, adrenal fatigue, is people getting a second wind in the evening, and then that interferes with their sleep problems. See if the values correlate with their energy patterns. If not, there may be something else going on. It could be stress, could be infection, could be a blood sugar issue. Most of the time, the salivary test will correlate pretty strongly with what that person is telling you how they feel throughout the day. Blood sugar is a big one when it comes to things that cause adrenal uh, issues. So I asked individuals, are they eating regularly? Are they skipping meals? What are they eating? Are they using any stimulants? Because that can certainly play a role in, a, in, a, in blood sugar problems. What are some of the stressors that may be causing mental emotional problems? Supplements and medications they're on. What kind, how much, et cetera. OK. Some other clinical pearls to keep in mind when you look at these test results. If you see the estrone increased, think adipose production. Somebody who may be overweight. That is a very common thing to see on these tests. High estrone is common, particularly in postmenopausal women, uh, because the adipose, adipose uh, tissue produces estrone. Premenopausal female, when did they do the test? Were they cycling regularly? In women who are cycling regularly, they're having a 27, 28 day cycle, we generally, or I generally recommend that they do the salivary test somewhere between day 19 and day 21 of their cycle. It's you know, not a perfect you know, time frame because you're getting a snapshot in time of any hormone cycle, particularly in you know, a woman cycling regularly, but it gives you a good measurement of estrogen and progesterone out you know, output. So essentially, you're getting a snapshot of hormone output at that particular time. But that seems to be the best. Now, remember, testosterone will peak at ovulation, and you know, as you know, as I've heard before, you know, it's nature's way of increasing desire and decreasing discretion. So, if you see testosterone elevated on a salivary test, see if the woman actually did that test around ovulation. A couple other clinical pearls. Puberty, pregnancy, and menopause can all alter thyroid function. That's, that's important. So a, woman go, a young girl going through puberty, a woman who's pregnant, and a woman going through menopause, that can be a time frame where they start to have thyroid issues. High testosterone without some obvious cause, you might want to think about polycystic ovary, uh, ovarian syndrome. High DHEA without some obvious reason, particularly they're not taking supplements for DHEA, Think severe adrenal stress, okay? They've lost the ability to compensate for adrenal stress through ACTH stimulation on the adrenals. 
one of the things that DHEA can be high because of a compensatory mechanism for long-standing stress. Um, and so that we see that pattern as well. So here's an example of an adrenal profile from Great Plains. And you'll notice here it looks at estrone. Remember before estrone can be elevated in uh, postmenopausal women uh, as well as individuals who are overweight. It looks at estradiol and estriol, progesterone, and testosterone. And then we have our four cortisols represented throughout the day, and then our DHEA. And it's that ratio between DHEA, excuse me, cortisol and DHEA that's really important in helping to stage adrenal patterns. Before we get into looking at specific examples of adrenal tests, let's go over a few things with respect to some adrenal therapy or adrenal supplements. Now, there's a wide variety of adrenal products on the market. New Beginnings Nutritionals carry some nice products. This is something called Adrenal Essence. It's an herbal remedy, well tolerated by most people. These are adaptogenic and adrenal support herbs. It's not overstimulating, so it's not going to drive the adrenals more. It's just going to give support to the adrenals. So it's a nice thing to implement. You know, usually two capsules or more daily. Some, maybe some people can benefit from two capsules with breakfast and two with lunch. Oftentimes, people who are under a lot of stress become B vitamin deficient. This is a nice product, this B complex, Basic Nutrients Plus. Uh, it has a wide variety of uh, vitamins and minerals, but you know, really good as far as the overall B complex. I usually use two to three capsules per day. Energy Plus is something that can be added on. It is, again, it's an herbal remedy that helps to support the adrenals. It also gives some benefit for the immune and overall cellular energy. One of the things that happens with people under adrenal fatigue, adrenal stress, is that their energy production is compromised and that affects their immune system. So this is another add-on that can give some added benefit for some people. New Beginnings has a wide variety of other products. This is a supplement package. This is something used quite a bit actually with special needs kids, but adults can take this as too, just as a, an overall you know, vitamin, mineral, and essential fatty acid a combination. And then we start getting into more adrenal-specific, cortisol-specific, pregnenolone specific, DHEA specific remedies. There is a lot of ways of supporting cortisol. Now licensed practitioners can prescribe things like hydrocortisone. Non-licensed practitioners or who, uh, doctors who can't prescribe medication may need to rely on things like glandular extracts. This is just an example of one which is a adrenal cortex that has some cortisol in it because you're getting it from an animal cortex. So this is one way of, of using natural cortisol through a particular supplement program if you've got cortisols that are extremely low. And I'd look to say one to two capsules or more daily based on you know your clinical uh, intake of your individual you're working with. If you are a prescribing doc, then there are options for prescription medication. Cortef is a very common hydrocortisone, and hydrocortisone is the is essentially the bi is bioidentical to cortisol. Now, this can be obtained from most pharmacies and even compounding pharmacies. Typical dose between 2.5 to 5 milligrams, and what I do is I time it to the specifically to the low cortisol value off of a salivary adrenal profile. So if the morning level was low, I might use you know, a two and a half, five milligram tablet of Cortef at that time. But then the noontime level is normal, but the afternoon is low, I probably wouldn't dose Cortef again until the afternoon. And it comes in various strengths. Now, A has been around a long time. It's been one of these sort of anti-aging remedies for, for quite some time. And it's important because it is the precursor to all sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, specifically. Not DHEA, but it's specific to estrogen and testosterone. It generally peaks around the age of 25, and then after it starts to decline. So usually it's around 10%, you know, those levels by the time you're 80. So, you know, DHEA for many people is an important thing to take. DHEA is actually produced from pregnenolone in the, in the adrenal gland. So pregnenolone comes DHEA. DHEA can be converted to estradiol and then 
also into testosterone. We do have some small amounts produced in the brain. Uh, interestingly is that exercise can help to increase uh, DHEA production. And this is just an example here of DHEA supplementation. It is a precursor to testosterone and estrogens indirectly. So it would be contraindicated when uh, estrogen is high and testosterone is high. Generally use it with adults only. It certainly isn't for special needs kids uh, and generally isn't you know, for children in general either. If you get too high a dose, it's possible to have things like mood swings, facial hair, acne may occur. Ideally, we'd like to see the cortisol to DHEA ratio around 5 to 1, you know, typically. And typical dosing of DHEA is 15 to 15 milligrams per day. Now, pregnenolone is another interesting remedy. Again, remember, pregnenolone is that master hormone. It's higher up on the food chain with all of these hormones. And it will feed down into DHEA. It will also convert through progesterone into cortisol. And it also supports aldosterone, which is important for sodium and potassium levels in the body. Typically not used in kids, although it could be. And you know, it is uh, something that you want to avoid if there's any kind of uterine, prostate, or breast cancer. Licorice root is an interesting remedy as well. What happens is the active component in licorice root called glycyrrhizin can help with headaches and low sex drive, anxiety, swollen breast, you know, uh, PMS symptoms, etc. Because what it does is it helps to increase the half-life of cortisol. Whatever cortisol is being produced, it increases the half-life of it. Now, there are some contraindications in things like high blood pressure, um, you know, heart failure, kidney disease. Personally, I've not seen a problem with those in individuals, but it is something, you know, to note. Usually the liquid extracts are about two to 300 milligrams, and so we're giving anywhere between 3.5 to 5 milligrams of glycerizin, you know, two to three times per day, depending on what the, what the cortisols are showing off of the salivary test. Okay, so here's a couple patient test scenarios. So John Doe, 21 years old, and notice here they have him listed in menopausal status male. Okay, so he's 21. So what I'll do first is I'll look down at the cortisol levels. Okay, we notice that the DHEA level is normal, and that would be expected in somebody who's 21, hopefully. The morning cortisol is in a normal range, and it's actually, you know, in a, in a pretty good range, optimal between 18 to 35, so that looks fine. But then all of a sudden, you see this seesaw pattern. It's normal, it's low. It's normal, it's low. The noontime level really drops off. You know, he's down here around 0.91, so he's extremely low. Whenever you see that pattern, that's very typical of somebody who has blood sugar problems normal and then excessively low at one point. And then he bounces back. Okay, So in the early evening, his levels are normal again. Albeit, it's not optimal, but they are normal. And then, of course, it drops off again. So typically, blood sugar issues are, are a problem here. His other look pretty good. I could make the case that for a 21-year-old male, his testosterone level is okay, not great, probably should be a little bit higher. <clears throat> Notice his estrone. What do you think is going on there? Okay, His estrone is high. 21-year-old guy, high estrone. We know it comes from adipose tissue. Okay testosterone and this whole blood sugar imbalance thing going on. This is just an, a graph here kind of indicating in, you know, from, this, uh, from Great Plains Labs that you would be essentially in what's called a, a adrenal phase one. Okay, so there's his test again. So let's kind of go over a couple things here. Well, his high estrone is likely from belly fat. Okay, what's his weight? He's probably a little bit overweight. Uh, doesn't exercise enough. That might be one reason. His testosterone is a bit low, and that can also come about because of. Uh, just an underproduction and through blood sugar imbalances. His output is sluggish. It should be optimal. It's not. His other estrogens look okay. 
he may be getting some aromatization of testosterone to estrogen, which can happen with excess blood sugar, okay? So this type of pattern is very typical of somebody who has that kind of that metabolic syndrome X scenario, hyperinsulinism, excess blood sugar, might be drinking alcohol too much, could be stress, I want to check a zinc status on him. All of these are promoters of aromatization of testosterone to estrogen, causing the estrone to be high. That zigzag pattern is classic for uh, poor blood sugar control. So a couple things you can do. You want to do a dietary assessment, do a diet diary, see what he's eating. I'd probably check a thyroid on him. Um, when I check thyroids, look at TSH, free T3, free T4, maybe do a reverse T3 as a baseline. Certainly blood chemistry, you know, fasting glucose, look at the fasting insulin. We'd like to see it less than 10. Hemoglobin A1C is important. This guy's probably higher than 10, I would imagine. Okay. And then a few other things. Testing, organic acid testing, stool, and then food IgG testing to round out the picture here, just to get a more general overall idea here of this guy's underlying issues. And then from an adrenal standpoint, I'd probably put them on something like pregnenolone, you know, 5 to 10 milligrams, 2 to 3 times a day. Probably start conservative and then maybe work up. Morning, noon, and afternoon, just to give a steady state level of pregnenolone to support the erratic uh, cortisol levels throughout the day. I would generally avoid pregnenolone after 6 p.m. at night because I don't want to interfere with sleep. And if somebody does even take an afternoon dose and it interferes with sleep, I might just say, hey, don't take it any time after 4 p.m. DHEA, 10 to 15 milligrams, two to three times a day. Again, nothing after 6. And then licorice root, okay? Two to three times a day, 50 to 100 milligrams, nothing after 6, time to the low cortisol. That's most important. You want to avoid licorice root in anybody who has a, def uh, a definite history of hypertension, albeit I've not seen it be a problem. It's just important to take note, OK? <clears throat> now, in this particular fella, if you're not getting good clinical response or you wanted to go straight to some kind of medication, Cortef, or what's called compounded hydrocortisone is not a bad option. Probably 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams, two to three cortisols would be sufficient. There is a product out of the UK called Adrenal Max that is five milligrams of hydrocortisone, and that is obtainable without a prescription at the time of this recording out of the U UK. Um, you just look up Adrenal Max on the internet. All of these remedies really are linked to specific times of the day when the cortisols are low. And then, of course, we've got some other things. You know, vitamin C, B vitamins, herbal adaptogens. By the way, all of those remedies I mentioned up front, the Adrenal Essence, the Basic Nutrients Plus, will have it in there. Get this guy exercising. Probably a good thing for him would be training, you know, some cardio, some plyometrics, some weights, build up that testosterone level. And clearly, you know, he likely needs to make some adjustments in his eating and his lifestyle. And then retest in about 90 days. Okay, so Jane Doe, 52 years old. They have her listed as postmenopausal. And again, let's come down and take a look at the cortisol levels. We notice that the morning cortisol is normal. Is it in the optimal range? Yeah, just barely, okay? Um, just barely, but it's still okay. Noontime is normal too, but it's kind of on the low end of normal, so things are trending down. Evening and nighttime cortisol is all low, and our DHEA is low. One thing about our DHEA being low, remember, that is the loss of the ability to help compensate for adrenal stress. She's 52. Ideally, it should be a lot higher. We're going to lose some DHE as time goes on, but we'd like to see that level much higher. A couple other things. Estradiol is low. That certainly fits with being postmenopausal. Progesterone low, same thing. Testosterone is normal. Is it optimal? Yeah, you know, it's okay. They're, they're, they're mentioning here, you know, 30 to 60 if you're using supplementation. So it's not in a bad level. Uh, and it's actually an okay level despite the fact that she's got low DHEA. Notice the estrone is high, okay? Very common with women who are in postmenopause. 
Okay, and that's the, there we go with the chart again. So let's go ahead and just kind of take a few observations for Jane Doe. High estrone, common to postmenopause, maybe be some adipose tissue related as well. Now the high estrone may be skewing the overall ratio of estradiol to estriol, causing it to be lower than it really is. So that probably goes back to her whole postmenopausal state. The progesterone is low, which is expected. DHEA is low, which we've talked before. Uh, and the cortisol, the only normal value actually is the morning, but you want to correlate to see how she feels because that may be the only time of the day she feels okay. Noontime was suboptimal, but everything else is just kind of trending downwards. <clears throat> okay, same kind of thing. You know, diet, diet assessment, look at thyroid, look at blood sugars, and you know, your other types of tests are worth doing. A couple things with respect to your blood chemistry and blood sugar is they're worth doing as you know, these issues tend to become more prevalent. In, in the postmenopausal years. So it's important, I think, just from a general preventative standpoint with people to be looking at those factors. An adrenal program, 15 to 20 milligrams, two to three times a day. DHEA, about 10 milligrams, you know, two to three times a day, you know, time pretty much to the same time that you give progest the pregnenolone. The licorice root, probably do a very similar pattern that we had done before. If we have a history of high blood pressure, I'd look to avoid it. You know, it would have to be you know pretty significant for me to avoid it 100%. And then, of course, you would just kind of want to avoid these things if a person has bad insomnia. Maybe just don't push it past four o'clock with your dosing. Cortef is an option. You got to watch for some water weight issues with Cortef. It's a great thing, but some women will develop some water weight and really not be too happy. Progesterone, not a bad idea at this point. Use about 25 milligrams, you know, nightly, you know, day one through 21 of the calendar month can be helpful. Either transdermal uh, or oral, you might want to look at, you know, using about 50 milligrams. Um, oral micronized progesterone is good for sleep. And if sleeping is worse, you know, what's happening is you may be getting some progesterone to cortisol conversion, a shift that may happen. So if you give micronized oral, you may, and you're getting a worsening of sleep, then you've got to consider the fact that that progesterone is actually shifting uh, and producing more cortisol. Okay. And the supplementation and intervention are, are similar to the last fella. All right. So Jenny Doe, 49 years old. She's listed as premenopause. Well, let's see. Let's come and take a look at the, D, uh, the cortisol levels. We notice the DHEA is high. Okay, why would that be? You know, is it possible she's on DHEA supplementation? You want to check. Could it be an excessive compensatory response to low adrenals, you know, adrenal stress? Maybe. She certainly could have a robust, um, you know, DHEA reserves. It doesn't appear that it's causing an excess conversion to testosterone, although her testosterone is in a in a healthy range, so it, maybe it's likely supporting that, which is not a bad thing. The cortisol levels look okay morning, noon, and nighttime. Are they optimal? Well, they're normal. They're not really optimal. And then our evening time is, is certainly low. So everything's kind of trending on the low end here. Estrone, estradiol, estriol look okay. Progesterone is low. It's typical of women who are in that perimenopausal state. And there we go again. All right, so let's do a quick review on Jenny, okay? Very low progesterone. What you want to ask for is where was she in her cycle, okay? Remember, in a woman who is cycling, the progesterone is going to be highest in the second half of the cycle, that luteal phase, compared to the first half. You could be having you know, caught this test somewhere in early in her cycle. High normal testosterone causes, well, as I mentioned before, it could be getting strong conversion from DHEA. Another consideration is polycystic ovarian syndrome, possibly. High DHEA can also be compensatory as well from chronic stress. So we know that she's got some DHEA reserve, and that's not a bad thing. But the concern is, is that all the cortisols tend, are, you know, sort of trending towards the low end. So again, kind of a typical 
you know, thing you'd want to do as far as you know, coming in and reassessing. Dietary assessment, diet diary, look at thyroid, blood chemistries, and your usual suspect. Look at food sensitivities, uh, organic acid testing, stool testing, which really help round out the picture. From a supplement standpoint, I'd be conservative using pregnenolone, you know, 15 to 20 milligrams, two to three times a day, licorice root, a little bit lower on this patient versus the others, 50 to 75 milligrams, and again, avoid after four o'clock. The one thing I wouldn't be using would be DHEA, okay? And the reason is, is for DHEA is already high. Cortef, maybe. You know, if we're not getting good clinical response, again, you want to watch for water weight gain, but Cortef can it certainly could be useful. Progesterone, um, you know, 25 milligrams nightly, you know, day 15 to 27 of the calendar, and if you're going to be, you know, using uh, a transdermal or oral, uh, then you know, something like 50 milligrams is appropriate. The micronized, again is certainly good for sleep, but you may get a worsening if that progesterone is being converted into cortisol. So again, the additional supplementation or intervention are similar you know, to the others. All right, well, what about the test scenario? So ask yourself as, you, as I present this, what would you do in this particular circumstance? So this, this patient here, Wilma, is 47 years old. She has three kids, 14, uh, 11, and nine. And her chief complaints is that she feels tired all the time, poor sex drive, constantly feels overwhelmed, not sleeping well, just holding on to a lot of water, has got some digestive issues. And then you know, her husband states, you know, she's very moody and easily becomes angry at the kids and him as well. So, so we take a look at Wilma's test. Essentially, go back to looking at your adrenals again, OK? DHEA is normal. That's good. We notice the testosterone is high, okay? Uh, certainly she has some extra DHE, uh, excuse me, she's got some testosterone that's high, so we want to find out about that, okay? And we'll come back to that in a sec. The court morning cortisols are normal, but they're low normal, and then everything else is low. So she's definitely in a, you know, a, a, a late stage adrenal exhaustion pattern, uh, and she's, you know, likely what you're going to see is the DHA eventually drop and you know, compromise her ability to compensate for adrenal stress. Estradiol is low, progesterone is low. This is more typical of postmenopause. She's probably in that perimenopausal state. And the testosterone is high. We've got to figure out what that's coming from. And there it is again. OK. Well. Essentially, one of the things you want to ask yourself, particularly with that, that high testosterone, is, is her husband on any testosterone products, any testosterone cream that could be you know, causing a problem there? The other thing to consider is polycystic ovaries and you know, syndrome X, high insulin, all of these factors that can create those problems and drive testosterone high in some individuals. So from a supplement standpoint, same kind of thing. Pregnenolone, 15, 20 milligrams, two to three times a day. DHEA, she likely really doesn't need it. You might try five to 10 milligrams as maintenance. Uh, some licorice root to help increase the half-life of cortisol would certainly be appropriate. Cortef, not a bad idea in this particular circumstance. Um, you know, you may, may get better clinical results doing it that way. Progesterone. You know, usually nightly, you know, something like this, you know, day 15 to 27 of the calendar month um, is, can help them sleep better. It also can have a, uh, an anxiety decreasing effect and more of a calming effect as well. Thing is, is again, it's, it's sort of linking all of your remedies to specific times of the day when those cortisols are low. And then do other nutrient support, other adrenal support, B vitamin support, mineral support, et cetera. OK, so kind of wrapping things up here, what are some key factors for all individuals when working with adrenal programs? 
Well, one thing is diet. And the reality is, is a lousy diet will override the best supplement programs. You can give people, and you, you as a patient can take very expensive supplements, but if you're not eating healthy, it really doesn't matter how many supplements you take. You're just not going to get the adequate nutrients you need. Lifestyle is critical. You know, how you move throughout your day, exercise, drink, smoking, all of that stuff will compromise any kind of health program. Sleep is critically important and stress management are, are critically important, you know, to overall health. And then really what I call everything else, all right? All of these things will affect your adrenals big time, but it's everything else, digestive function, elimination, you know, blood sugar control, chronic infections, what you're being exposed to environmentally. So there are other things that you need to test for. That's why I recommend doing the food IgG, doing the organic acid test, looking at a stool analysis, looking at heavy metals minimally to see if there's any other stressors that are causing a problem because we can throw anything into this list. It's not just going to be one thing. It's multiple things that impact the brain and the brain's you know, interaction with the adrenals and the excess production of cortisol and the problems that it creates in DHEA, and then our physical problems that take place over time create these all of these chronic issues that are affecting thousands upon thousands of people. A couple things here. We have a particular website called Lab Test Plus. Lab Test Plus is an opportunity for individuals to obtain various functional medicine tests on their own, where you can order through the website and have these test kits delivered to your home or office. And each lab is personally reviewed by an integrative medicine doctor. I do one of those reviews, or I'm one of the people that's involved in those reviews. And you get written, um, and you know, not only interpretation of, of the information, but also what are called action step suggestions on what are some things that could be helpful for what the lab is indicating. And also we have access to professional line supplements. And so you can actually list, look for a complete list of labs at labtestplus.com. One of the other things we have on this site is a whole resource center and videos and articles that talk about the testing, what they mean, what are the indications, why you'd want to do it, what are they recommended for. And if you have a specific question about what maybe labs might apply to your particular circumstance, then what you can do is go to labtestplus.com, go under the which test section, and submit your question. Uh, and we can help kind of guide the process. If you are interested in having more direct communication with me, uh, I do provide uh, consultations for people at a distance as well as local. The email is info at mysunrisecenter.com. Uh, and our phone number is 951-461-4800. If you want to get more information about me, my consulting practices, books that I've written, uh, lectures that I'm involved in, etc., you can actually just go to drwoller.com. So I hope everybody enjoyed this information. I hope it's useful for you personally if you're a practitioner. I certainly hope it's useful for your practice. The biggest thing is, is just start testing looking at these factors, start working with these products, and you know, implementing these different uh, protocols in an appropriate way uh, to help individuals. So with that, I will sign off, and thank you very much.